Voilà, bonjour à tous et encore une fois merci euh, d'être là euh, pour ces journées. Merci à la Bibliothèque nationale de France de nous accueillir et merci aussi à Bertrand Lavédrine de m'avoir fait cette proposition de présider cette première partie euh, de cette séance du matin. Effectivement, je pense que c'est un petit peu euh, symbolique au sens où nous sommes actuellement dans ce processus de, de, de travail en commun et de rapprochement entre nos équipes sur le plan de la recherche. Effectivement, le musée de la musique que certains d'entre vous connaissent sans doute, qui est situé à la Cité de la Musique, est une, euh, est une relativement petite entité sur le plan euh, du nombre de, de, de chercheurs, euh, mais il nous a semblé effectivement dans les discussions que nous avions eues avec Bertrand et à la suite d'ailleurs de de collaboration déjà euh, entamée sur certains sujets de recherche euh, au travers de contacts euh, plus ou moins informels ou, et d'autres d'ailleurs plus établis entre euh, nos équipes, qu'il y avait euh, à partir de notre collection constituée euh, essentiellement d'instruments de musique mais aussi de documents graphiques, d'archives et, et, de, et de documents plutôt de type iconographique, euh, beaucoup de points communs dans nos recherches, euh, l'instrument de musique étant un objet particulier composé généralement de nombreux euh, matériaux différents et présentant aussi un certain nombre de questions spécifiques, euh, que ce soit du point de vue de la chimie ou de la physique, d'ailleurs aussi lorsqu'on parle de la mise sous contrainte, de la mise en état de jeu, etc., de ces instruments. Mais le temps file et je ne vais pas euh, être plus long euh, sur nos propres activités car euh, l'idée c'est quand même avant tout de euh, lancer euh, les débats de ce colloque. Le premier sujet est un sujet qui je crois nous concerne tous et, et certainement euh, nous-mêmes en tant que musée sommes évidemment constamment euh, con, euh, confrontés à cette question de la lumière et de la manière dont nous pouvons finalement euh, concilier les aspects à la fois de conservation des documents et de présentation au public. Nous sommes évidemment en tant que musée toujours très euh, sensible à la question de leur accès au, à nos différents publics, qu'ils soient professionnels ou euh, grand public, et il est clair qu'il est important de, euh, de, de se pencher sur ces questions et de faire un petit peu l'état de l'art, je crois que ce sera euh, le sujet des communications que nous aurons ce matin. Donc la première communication, et donc je salue euh, Monsieur Paul Whitmore, qui est donc euh, chimiste, euh, qui a travaillé donc d'abord à l'Environmental Quality Laboratory de Caltech, et puis au Centre de la Conservation de, du Harvard University Art Museum. Il dirige actuellement le Art Conservation Research Center, un institut qui était précédemment installé à, au Carnegie Mellon University à Pittsburgh et qui, depuis mars 2013, a rejoint donc le centre de conservation for conservation and preservation, voilà, je vais garder le titre officiel, de euh, Yale University. Euh, donc, je salue et j'accueille M. Paul Whitmore. Well, my French is not very good, so I didn't understand all of that, but I heard my name, so I, so I came up. I want to start by thanking the program committee and the organizing committee for inviting me to this symposium uh, to celebrate the 50-year anniversary of CRCC. And I just want to mention that it's not just celebrating 50 years of existence of this organization, but 50 years of its excellence and world, world leadership. It's a testament to the national commitment to preservation of cultural heritage in France and to the visionary leadership of Madame Flieder and Monsieur Lavadrine. It's a shining example of successful research and its implementation So I want to thank you for your contribution to the world's preservation efforts and for inspiring people like me who seek similar success for our own laboratories. You showed us the way. And we'll have to have some magic happen. There we go. Uh, 
Um, it's not my usual practice to put a question mark at the end of my lecture titles. Um, if, for those of you who do research, you know that that's what you have until you're done. But I'll explain later why I've added this qualifying question mark. Let me relieve the suspense now, though, and provide my answer to the question. Can we enjoy better preservation of collection objects by exhibiting them under LED lighting? My answer is yes. I think so. Maybe. Now, let me explain. Before I begin discussing the subject of this presentation, though, I want to first recognize my colleagues at the Art Conservation Research Center, whose work I have the privilege to present to you today. The original idea for this project came from Dr. Pierre Vernet, who was a po postdoctoral fellow in our center, and who was working on a different project related to perception and changes in appearance. Pierre came across this lighting subject during his reading, and as any good researcher would do, he made a connection and he wanted to learn more. Dr. Chong Tao was a st scientist on the staff of the center at the time, and he joined with Pierre to build and conduct the experiment that I will be describing. I'm the one doing the presenting today simply because I remain employed at the center while Pierre and Chong have moved on to other jobs. While it was not the focus of Pierre's project at the time, he could easily appreciate the importance of controlling light damage to objects during exhibition. It continues as a subject of research at our center and at many other places. It poses particular challenges because it is one of the arenas where conservation concerns are in direct opposition to the use and enjoyment of artifact collections. As a result, it requires information, clear thinking, and a realistic consideration of all the key views in order to develop sensible strategies to control the risks. We've come a long way in our approach to solving this fundamental dilemma, and you will hear of some of that progress in other talks at this meeting. But to a large extent, the primary option to control light damage to sensitive colors remains the same as it has always been. Reduce the dose of damaging wavelengths delivered to the object. These preventive measures have become commonplace, and they are often the steps that are implemented first in trying to manage risks of light damage. El eliminate ultraviolet radiation from the lighting environment. We don't need UV to view objects, except for fluorescent ones and it simply causes damage that is easily avoided. Reducing UV intensities does not tend to protect, protect very sensitive colors, though, which are damaged from exposure to visible wavelengths instead. So we reduce light levels in order to lower the doses of light delivered to, during exhibition. We also build dark periods into the life of sensitive objects, thus reducing their cumulative light exposure even more. Rotating objects on exhibit that is, displaying sensitive objects for only limited periods and then returning them to dark storage, is a common method of prolonging the usable life of objects, not by making them degrade more slowly while on view, but by spreading their service life in pieces over a longer time. It's this notion of adding periods of darkness to an object's life that is the subject of the research that I'll describe. Taking objects off of exhibit and placing them into dark storage is not the only way to add these dark periods we can just turn off the lights. The challenge is to do this in such a way that a viewer will not see that it has been done. Exploring this strategy becomes a journey into the fundamental processes of human vision and perception. Even after many years of research, much of that subject is not well understood. Simply reading the pertinent literature on this subject seems to require one to become some combination of psychologist and ophthalmologist. Being a chemist by training, Believe me when I say that I very much felt the need for a psychologist's help throughout this project. But I will do my best to explain what I think I understand from the work of earlier vision researchers and how those principles have informed some of the more recent developments and studies, including our own. At its most basic, this is a story of turning lights on and off and how humans perceive that changing condition. We do that every day without trying, for the sun comes up and it is light, and it goes down and it becomes dark. When that light to dark cycle, that light to dark to light cycle is slow, we have no trouble perceiving and tracking that change, and our perception is represented by the red line. Speed up that cycle, like turn the lights, turning the lights on and off faster and faster, and eventually we'll start to have trouble following that change exactly because our visual system is not infinitely fast. 
It takes time for neurons to fire and recover and for our brains to process those signals. As a result, there's a built-in time lag to our perception of rapid changes. More rapid flashes will eventually be occurring faster than our visual response time and we'll be unable to fully process the change in lighting condition before it is changed again. We sense the changes as a flicker, like a fluorescent light that's not fully on, but we no longer sense any periods when the lights are fully on or periods of total darkness. Finally, for very rapidly pulsing lights, one reaches a stage when the flashes are happening too quickly to perceive the light-dark changes. This is the, so the point of so-called flicker fusion, which occurs when changes are happening at a rate above the critical flicker frequency, or CFF. We do not sense any modulation of light intensity. Over the years, new generations of innovators have been tempted to think of this as a way to add imperceptible dark periods to the exhibition of an object. Just pulse the light above the critical flicker frequency and no one will see the dark periods and we'll, we will have kept some of the damaging light from being delivered to the object. The problem, as you well know, is it just doesn't work. While your eyes will not perceive the dark periods during the very rapid flashing of the lights, you will still sense the dark periods as an overall reduction in brightness. This is actually how LED dimmers work, by pulsing the lights with varying fractions of time when they're switched on. The brightness you perceive will be the same as the brightness produced by a continuous light having the same time average light intensity. This is the Talbot Plateau Law, a feature of visual perception that was described, demonstrated, and measured in the early 19th century. So take away half the light by turning it off for half the time, and you'll see it as being half as bright as an uninterrupted non-flashing light. To recover the apparent brightness of the pulsed lights, one would have to increase the intensity of the flashes until the time averaged intensity is the same as it was before you started flashing the light. By doing that, though, the total light flux will be the same as the one you started with, and you have gained no benefit from adding those imperceptible dark periods. This lesson of the Talbot Plateau Law has been learned repeatedly over the years, as people have tried to gain some preservation benefit by putting mechanical shutters or choppers in display lights, hoping to reduce the light dose during exhibition. But does the Talbot Plateau Law work this way all the time? What Pierre Vernet, the postdoctoral fellow at our center, learned during his reading was that human vision works in a peculiar way when viewing light flashes under certain circumstances. Human perception of flashes of light was the subject of intense study starting at the end of the 19th century when motion picture technology was emerging. In that research, an unusual feature of human visual perception was discovered and characterized. Two effects were described and named, but they, be, they may be manifestations of the same visual function. The first of these is the Broca-Seltzer effect. This effect describes the strange result that people will perceive a very short flash of light as being brighter than it actually is. The brightness enhancement depends mainly on the intensity of the flash, but it also depends on its duration. Flashes of light that are about 50 milliseconds long are perceived with the largest enhancement. In the published data, enhancements of four times or more are reported for flashes of 50 milliseconds. That is, a flash of 170 lux intensity is perceived as being a flash that is 700 lux. The second effect, the Brooke Bartley effect, says the same thing about a series of light flashes, which will look brighter than they actually are if the flashes are about 50 milliseconds long. There has been much research into these two unusual visual effects, and their dependence on the nature of the light stimulus that produces such brightness enhancements. There not, do not seem to be many definite trends, and in fact, on those rare occasions when two researchers have done similar experiments, the same results are not always produced. This is the challenge of studying the psychology of visual perception, and it drives physical scientists like me crazy. It reduces my meticulously controlled objective instrumental measurements to a consumer survey. But there's no escaping it. Human perception can only be tested with humans perceiving things and telling you what they see. No objective instrumental measurement can replace that survey or verify its validity, at least not yet. So experimentally, defining the exact nature of the Broca-Seltzer effect has been challenging, and the origin of that effect remains completely unknown. But not knowing what you're doing has never held back experimental science. Nor has it prevented innovators from creating things that function, even if we don't know exactly why they work. 
People have begun to try to take advantage of this peculiarity of perception. In the case of LED technologists, they've wanted to take advantage of the Broca-Sulzer effect in order to use less energy to light spaces. There have been a few recent studies, but two stand out. The work of Jino and his colleagues in Japan was the research that Pierre first came across, and our study grew out of their findings. Jino used flashing red, green, and blue LEDs, which was the most advanced mature LED technology at the time. He used flashes that were pretty short, about one millisecond long, and repeated them at 60 hertz, or every 17 milliseconds. This pulse duration is much shorter than the 50 millisecond pulses that give the maximum brightness enhancement from the Broca-Sulzer effect, and, but there's no prior data to indicate how much brightness enhancement is perceived with these very short flashes. But since Jino was aimed at energy savings, having the lights off for most of the time, in, ca in his case, having the light off 95% of the time, made sense. The 60 hertz frequency he used is convenient because it's the line frequency for AC voltage supplies, but this frequency is deliberately chosen because it is above the critical flicker frequency for most people, so no flickering should have been perceptible. Gino's test subjects viewed scenes illuminated with these flashing colored LEDs and compared them to the same scenes illuminated with continuous non-flashing LEDs. Those viewers reported observing brightness enha enhancements of up to a factor of two for scenes lit with the green and blue LEDs. The red LED illumination, when flashed in the same way, showed much less brightness enhancement. We designed our experiment to extend Jino's study, examining whether the conditions under which the flashing LEDs could produce an equivalent visual experience to the continuous LED illumination could also produce significant savings not to reduce energy consumption, but to reduce the light-induced damage to sensitive materials. Following Jino's work, we used flashing LED conditions that were similar to his, 60 hertz frequency and either one or two millisecond pulse durations, or five or 10% duty cycles. Unlike Jino, who used colored LEDs, we used white LEDs and we tested four different products. The flashing LED was, was pulsed with five volt pulses and the continuous LED was operated with voltages that were randomly selected by a computer program to be between 2.6 and 3.2 volts, a range that delivered light that was a little dimmer and a little brighter than the flashing LEDs. We asked observers to view red, green, and, or blue targets when, it w when each was illuminated by either a flashing LED or the continuous LED and to describe the relative brightness of the target. We also asked whether they sensed any changes in the hues of the targets, which might arise if the brightness enhancement was not occurring uniformly across the spectrum, as Jino's results suggested. This was repeated 30 times for each subject, and the results compiled to, to determine the voltage of the continuous LED that created the best match to the appearance of the target under the flashing LED. This is an example of the results for one of the LEDs reporting the average voltage for the continuous LED that viewers said produced the same brightness of the red, green, and blue targets. As you can see, the reported voltage numbers are the same for each of the three colors. So we are not seeing the color-dependent visual effect that Jino reported from his experiment. These are the results for all four white LEDs, and I've dropped the results for the individual colors because they were essentially the same for each color. Again, these are the voltages used to light the continuous LEDs so that the targets look the same as those illuminated by the flashing LED. The result is something like what you might expect. The, fla the LED flashing with the 5% duty cycle is delivering roughly half the light as the LED flashing with the 10% duty cycle, so we needed more light from the continuous LED to match the 10% than the 5% flashing LED. That's why all of the numbers for the 10% are writing high, higher than the numbers for the voltages at the 5% duty cycles. We just needed brighter light to match the brighter flashing lights. Um, you can also see that there's not much variation in applied voltage among the different LEDs for the equivalent conditions. However, the different LEDs aren't producing the same amount of light at a given voltage, so we are looking at slightly different light intensities for each LED. In order to make the comparison we wanted to make, how does the light flux from the flashing LED and the continuous LED compare when they're producing the same visual experience, 
we needed to measure the light fluxes produced at these voltage conditions. So we did that. Using a spectral radiometer, we measured the time averaged light flux from the continuous and the flashing LEDs when operated under the voltage conditions that made them look the same. These are the results of the comparison of the flashing to the continuous light fluxes. For LED 1, flashed with a 5% duty cycle, that is, with 1 millisecond pulses, that's this one, the same appearance of the targets was produced with 49% of the light flux as that same LED operated continuously. At 10% duty cycle, it took 58% as much light flux from the flashing LED to create the same visual appearance as the continuous, and so on. For the longer flashes, the 10% duty cycles, the flashing LED needed to deliver slightly more light in order to reproduce the same appearance as the continuous LED. But all of these numbers indicate significantly lower light fluxes were needed in order to reproduce the visual appearance under the continuous LED. The other thing to note here is that the different LEDs produce slightly different quantitative results. So flashing some types of LEDs or some individual units might be better at creating this equivalent experience with less light delivered. We do not know why this should be, but this variable LED performance could be a factor in having different experimental studies reporting different outcomes. There was another way we were able to measure the light fluxes delivered by the LEDs operated in the continuous and flashing mode, a way that was a more direct measure of the preservation benefit that might be afforded. We faded a light-sensitive material under the LEDs and recorded the time it took to fade it to a particular level. We used a light check ultra dosimeter for the sensitive material, thanks Bertrand, and measured the hours it took to fade it to a CIE delta E of 30, measured in the usual way. Under the continuous LED, operated at the voltage that duplicated the appearance of the flashing LED, it took about 50 hours to reach that degree of fading. The same LED operated in flashing mode did not cause that degree of fading until 70 hours of exposure. This measure indicates the flashing LED is delivering about 70% the light flux as the continuous mode operation, consistent with our more direct measure of the light fluxes, where we recorded the flashing LED delivering 68% of the flux of the continuous. But more to the point, this suggests the same visual experience can be produced with a flashing LED while extending the time to reach some div given degree of fading by 40%. The conclusions of our study are, we've re reproduced the finding of Gino and his colleagues in which observers report a brightness enhancement for a flashing LED. More specifically in our case, observers report an equivalent visual experience with lower delivered light fluxes from the flashing LEDs, about 20 to 50% 50, 50 lower than the continuously operated LED. We believe this derives from the Broca-Seltzer effect. Our tests did not reveal any particular dependence on color, as Gino's observers had reported. The targets did not look to be of changing hue under the two conditions, and the reported brightness enhancement was essentially identical for the different colored targets. We did observe that the different LEDs did perform quantitatively differently, and it is not clear whether each LED must be tested to identify the LED and its operating conditions that will provide these benefits. There have been two other studies that were reported after our own experiment. One, published last year, used white LEDs flashed at between 17 and 500 milliseconds, which spans the flash duration that maximizes the Broca-Seltzer enhancement. That was 50 milliseconds. This condition was very different from Gino's study and our own, which used one millisecond flashes. The observers in this recent study reported brightness enhancement with maximum enhancement seen for 67 millisecond flashes. Using LEDs flashing with this pulse duration, equivalent viewing experiences were produced with 20% less energy, that is, with less light delivered. While this study suggests that there is much more to explore in determining the optimum conditions for LED flashes that can produce this effect, it is yet another test that has reported brightness enhancement and suggests the value of further development of this approach to lighting with flashing LEDs. If these had been all the experiments to date, they would represent a very promising path for further development. But there was one more study, which looks much like Gino's experiment, scaled up to a display case lit with flashing red, green, blue, and amber LEDs. 
The result was at odds with the other studies I just described. No brightness enhancement was observed, the Talbot Plateau law was obeyed, and to see things as bright with flashing lights required increasing the flash intensity until there was no difference in light flux from the continuous LED. This different result may simply reflect our limited understanding of this visual effect and our poor ability to test for it definitively. More research must obviously be done. So in conclusion, I will just repeat the answer I gave at the start of the, to the question in my title. Can LED illumination, tuned to take advantage of the peculiar way we perceive flashing lights, give us the same visual experience while using less light on the objects? My answer is a provisional yes. I am persuaded by the results of our own experiment and of the other experiments that were done differently, which indicated that this unusual perception effect can be exploited in this way. Yet I remain cautious. There is much to explore, and explanations are still lacking for the experiments whose results seem to follow the Talbot Plateau law. The scientist in me wants to understand, but the technologist in me is saying, just build something that works even if I do not yet understand. We will continue this work and hope to eventually arrive at both destinations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 